This week on Fireside Chat, we talk about the bittersweet week that it's been for the Flames. A new general manager is appointed, and Peter Marr retires. This is episode 45, recorded May 1st. You can't put it in the wind column! Are you ready? See you, Red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Been quite a week for the Flames. A couple big events this week, and this is Dan and Matt back with you. How you doing, Matt? Uh, good as always. We weren't planning to broadcast this week, but we have some big events that we thought that we had to chat about. Let's start with the first event that happened, and that was that the Flames finally announced their new general manager. The Flames brought in a rookie general manager, Brad Treliving, who has been working with the Phoenix Coyotes um, as the assistant general manager under Don Maloney there. Not a guy that we know a lot about, but based on what you do know, Matt, how do you feel about the uh, appointment of Jim Tr- as uh, Brad Treliving? I said Jim Treliving. He's the son of Jim Treliving, the... Uh, star people might know from Dragon's Den and the owner of Boston Pizza. But how do you feel about Bradshaw Living getting the job? Uh, he seems to have all the qualities that you would want in a general manager. And he seems to be saying the right things for like how to proceed with the rebuild. So as long as he keeps up with what he's professing, then you know that's all good. The thing that I think is interesting about Trit Living is that he has both sides. He was a professional hockey player. He played in the ECHL, the IHL, and the AHL. And he also has the business background. So he knows both from the player's side of the game and also from the business side, which I think is something that we don't see a lot these days. Yeah, and I'm just hoping that he's successful in his rookie attempt at being the GM and... You know, it's one of those things that we won't really be able to tell whether he's doing a good job or a bad job for another year or two. So, you know, it, it's kind of hard to pig exactly what, you know, like with Brian Burke, you know exactly what you're getting. So well, It's interesting you mentioned Brian Burke, too, because I think, to me anyways, if Brian Burke was not there as president of Hockey Ops... I would probably think this is a bad deal, bringing in a rookie GM into what's probably the most complicated thing to run, which is a rebuild. But I think because Berkey is there, it gives Trilliving that uh, guy to go to, that guy to get mentored by, and I th- I feel more confident having the rookie GM with the seasoned veteran as the president of Hockey Ops. Yeah, most definitely. The one word that he used in the press conference that struck me the most in a positive way was patience. And, you know, being patient with the rebuild and the prospects and not rushing them along. So, you know, that's one of the things that Burke, uh, he was saying, like, you know, doesn't want to, you know, always is trying to improve as fast as possible. So, you know, that always gets me a little nervous. <laughs> So. And it's well, I think as a guy who worked in Phoenix, uh, he understands what it means to build a young team as well. So I think that's going to be an invaluable knowledge to bring here. Yes, most definitely. From what Brian Burke said during some of his media availabilities and the press conference and that sort of thing, he said that during his process of trying to find the next GM, he reached out to other general managers, guys currently in the league, guys who aren't currently in the league, and asked, Who would you hire? And Treliving's name came up time and time again. So the fact that this isn't just, you know, Brian picking his favorite guy, that he's hearing this from other people, makes me a little bit more confident as well. Yeah, it's one of those things that, like, you or I might have an opinion one way or another, but if you're getting the same name cropping up after asking 10 or 15, 20 people, then, you know, usually that means that that guy's actually very good at what he's doing. Yeah. And just a historical note, Brad Living becomes the seventh general manager in Flames history, eight if you count Brian Burke. Um, we had Cliff Fletcher, Doug Risebrow, Al Coates, Craig Button, Daryl Sutter, Jay Feaster, Brian Burke, and now Brad Living. And the last guy in that list who was a rookie GM when we brought him in was Craig Button. So I'm confident that, uh, that Treliving's tenure here will be much more prosperous than Button's. Have to wait and see. <laughs> That's all we can do. Yep. 
When I was listening to Brian Burke's press conference after Trillivan was hired, I was a little bit nervous at the time that he said that this was the only candidate that they interviewed. Do you think that it's irresponsible to only interview one candidate? Yes and no. Uh, realistically, if a guy is, like, you're surveying GMs and the, the one guy's name keeps popping up at the top of the list or near the top, and the rest of the candidates are not as, you know, good based off the consensus, then, you know, you interview the guy, and if he gives a really good interview, then, you know, you might not need to go elsewhere. It's one of those things that, you know, I can see both sides Yeah, see, I know what you're saying, but to me, if I was the ownership, or even if I was Ken King, I would want to say, okay, we know that we all like Trill Living, but just to dot the I's and cross the T's, let's interview a couple of other guys just to make absolutely sure. Well, the thing is, is that uh, the Flames only had a short window with Trill Living, where, you know, like the other guys like Fuda or Hextall or some of the other names that are have been floating out there, like their teams are still were in the playoffs when we hired them. Philly's since been eliminated. I think he's with Philly now. Whatever. Either way, but you know, it's one of those things that the opportunity to get him it was available. The other guys they might have waited needed to wait till the off season, and then maybe say Vancouver comes in and gets the guy you wanted. It's you know, all yeah. about timing. and Yeah, I, I know what you're saying. I guess I'm just looking at it, and I've talked to some people that are in HR and that sort of thing, obviously not in professional hockey, but who say that they would never interview just one candidate. Even if they know one candidate is the right guy, they would always interview more than the one candidate, just in case. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not arguing that. Like, it's just, like, I, I'm trying to see it from the Flames' perspective of, you know, reasons why they might have done it that way versus, like, what you're saying of interviewing, like, five or six or seven candidates. And going back to what I was saying earlier about Brian Burke, even though Berkey did only interview one candidate, I feel confident because it's Brian Burke, who I have a lot of respect for as a hockey guy, whether I like some of the decisions or not that he's made in the past. I feel more confident that Berkey interviewed one guy and it's the right guy than I might have if Ken King was still in charge and said, oh yeah, I only interviewed one guy and this is our new GM. So I think it might be kind of that, okay, Berkey's in charge of hockey, we trust Burke, so in turn we'll just trust Burke's decision on this one. Yeah, and that's part of the reason why Burke was brought in by the Flames was to bring some credibility and hockey, you know, hockey knowledge that he has and all that, so... You know, it's a little bit more trustworthy than somebody that's not necessarily... A hockey guy. Yeah. So with Brad living now in the GM's office, uh, he needs to hire himself at least one assistant. And I think it's interesting that coming from a guy who was the co-pilot, as he likes to describe himself, in Phoenix... Um, I think that Brad Trillivan will have a better idea of what he needs in an assistant GM because he did that job for so long. But now we can shift from speculation of who will be helming the team to who will be the AGM of the team. And some of the names that have gone around, obviously Craig Conroy's name has been thrown in there. Brian Burke said they will also interview Kelly Kissio, who's currently the president of the Hitmen Hockey Ops. Um, probably some other people as well. I'm sure Trillivan has his own. Uh, people that he wants to interview, but do you have any idea or any guesses as to who you think might get the AGM chair? Well, I don't think that the Flames will just go with one G- AGM. Um, it's been a trend recently to have more and more people in the front office just to get different perspectives on things. Well, you can also have different specialties too. You know, you might have one guy who's the lawyer and one guy who's the CBA guy and one guy who's the hockey guy. Yeah. Or like the AGM in charge of player development or yeah, whatever. Yeah, VP player development or VP finance, that sort of thing. Yeah, so honestly, like I, I would keep Conroy as like one of the AGMs 
just, you know, and, like, just deal with the farm team and that kind of thing. Like, basically what he's doing now. So more of a player development type role. Yeah, and I'd bring a guy in like Kelly Kissio because he's done such a very good job with the Hitman that, you know, he deserves a, a spot. Like, he's done such a good job that, you know, credible people, you know, they deserve a shot at least, and I think he's done a very credible job with the Hitman, so gotta wait and see. Well, and, and he has that... Uh, management background too now, Kissio. You know, Conroy's never really been in management, if you will. But because Kissio has that, and I think that would bring a lot to the table as well. Mm hmm. And plus, you're getting somebody that's r rather familiar with the organization as it is. So it's not like you're needing to educate. You know, like, who a guy like Ben Hanowski is, because he would already know. And I think a lot of people fail to uh, remember, too, that we do have currently an acting assistant general manager, which is Mike Holditch, who's been with the team for quite a while. He joined the organization in 1994. So I think that Holditch, he's been said that he's been kind of our cap guy and that sort of thing. I think he'll stay on the team as well. Realistically, you could probably have 15 or 20 people in total in the hockey ops department so you know doing various tasks so it and, just you know, depends you, you and i talked about that before we came on the air tonight about will they hire just one guy or will they hire multiple guys and i've thought for a while and told people that i've talked to that yeah i believe that uh, the Flames won't end up with one general manager. I think they will have a couple general managers. Some we may never see. You know, the the AGM in charge of finance will probably never see on camera, but will probably be there. And I think if I was structuring an organization, that's how I'd be structuring it. So yeah, I think you're right. A Kissio and a Conroy would be the kind of guys that would deal with the day-to-day -day hockey operations, the farm team, the player dev, that sort of thing, and we would see more of them. And I think they're both very uh, likely candidates. Do you think that Trilivy might bring anybody over from the Phoenix organization? Honestly, I have no idea. And, you know, it's not like Phoenix's uh, front staff was heavily populated. So, you know, I don't think that there's anybody, you know, there, <laughs> really. So The only thing he might be able to do is bring over, like, his assistant from the farm team or a scout or something like that. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, Brad Treliving at the helm here. He's a young guy, which I like to see. It's almost it's almost like the Flames are rebuilding the front office at the same time they're rebuilding on the ice. They're hiring a young GM to grow with this team. Yeah. He's 44 years old, which is uh, young for a GM in the NHL. And he seems like he has a lot of energy. If you watch the initial press conference, he just seemed excited to be here and excited to take this job. And that's what I like to see. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, and I'm looking forward to the draft in June to see exactly what his game plan is and, you know, if he's going to override the scouts or, you know, let them do what they've been doing so well lately or, you know, what's what, really. And I think for a new GM, I mean, I've never been in that position, but I think, you know, as a guy coming into a draft like this where we pretty much know who the top five selections or six selections will be, and having one of those top six selections, it's kind of a nice way to ease yourself into a new organization. You really can't go wrong as long as you pick on the board. Yeah, exactly. Like, if you go off the board with, like, a Hayden Flurry, then, yeah, you are you might have screwed up. But as long as it's one of the regulars, you know, at the consensus top five, you're good to go. So, Brad Treliving is now here in Calgary. Um, as an interesting note, it was said that the Flames pretty much had one week to talk to him and close the deal, so this was all done very quickly. But he's now here in Calgary, he's already taken the helm, and Berkey's really made it known that Brad will be the guy to make the draft pick. It won't be Berkey, it will be Brad. Even if Burke doesn't agree with it, he's he's not going to override stuff. So, I'm I'm looking forward to the, uh, the time of Brad Treliving as our GM, and I look forward to see what he's going to do. Yeah, same here. It'll be interesting to see how he approaches things moving forward because the Flames have a lot of the beginnings of a foundation of a cup caliber team. It's just how will he 
progress things forward. And I think as a guy who was in Phoenix and had to work with a budget like they did, I think he's probably going to be the right guy for a rebuild like this. I think he's going to know how to work within the cap system and really manage that cap really well, which perhaps other general managers lately that we've had haven't. So I think that's really going to help us as we get out of the rebuild and start looking towards becoming a playoff contender again as well. Yeah, efficiency matters. And, you know, when you're in a situation like Phoenix, you have to be really damn efficient. <laughs> yeah, well, and just because you have $64 million or whatever it's going to be by that time for the cap doesn't mean you should just spend it all and spend it frivolously. I think that some of that financial training he had there is really going to help him negotiate better contracts and really say, where can I trim fat, you know? Mm-hmm. I might have a guy who's making eight hundred thousand. Does he need to stay on the roster? Could I bring up a farm guy at you know five twenty five on a two way to fill that kind of roster spot? Yeah, exactly. All depends. Just gotta wait and see. <laughs> well, that was the good news for this week. I guess this has been kind of a bittersweet week for Flames fans. Um, the day after Brad Treliving was announced as general manager, uh, Flames fans were dealt. What I wouldn't say a blow, but probably one of the saddest moments that we've had lately, and that Peter Marr announced that he will be retiring from the broadcast booth and will not be the play by play voice of the Flames next year. What were your thoughts when you heard that initially, Matt? Honestly, I was extremely disappointed, you know, because Peter's meant so much for the organization and the fans and the city that, you know, he's the guy that, like, you associate with the Flames. You know, he's he's been the announcer pretty much from day one since they arrived in Calgary, and, like, all the important key moments in Flames history, he was there for, calling it for everybody else, so... And I think that's why it's bittersweet, is I think we all love Peter, and we want him to be happy in his retirement, But we're being a little bit selfish, perhaps, and saying, well, I don't want Peter to go. I'm not, you know, done with Peter yet. Yeah, exactly. It's the same kind of sentiment that people had when Theo got dealt or Ginla got dealt. Uh, You know, you just, you get attached to people and you don't want to, you know, you grow to like them and you don't want them to leave your existence And, you know, I think we've been spoiled as Flames fans, too, because we hear Peter Marr as our play-by-play voice. And if you listen to any other games from other cities, we're so lucky to have such a great announcer. I mean, he's a Hall of Famer, but we're so lucky to have Peter Marr as our announcer. And I really feel bad for the guy who has to replace him next year, whoever that might be. That's not a job I would want. I wouldn't want to be the guy who has to come in and fill Peter's shoes, because fans are always going to say he's not Peter Marr. He's not as good as Peter Marr. I miss the yeah, baby, that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Well, look at the the procession of TV announcers since Ed Whalen and how everybody seems to rip on literally everyone that's ever called games since then. When you got somebody that's just that good, you know, you, uh, you can't just up and replace someone like that. And Peter Mars more than just an announcer, too. I mean, he's the Flames historian. We've all listened to him call games. The man is, you know, a walking encyclopedia of Flames knowledge. And not having that is going to, I think, hurt the broadcast a little bit next year. Oh, it'll be a devastating blow to the broadcast. You know, and whoever they get to replace it, what him, whether it's like Peter Lubardius or whomever... You know, like, it just won't be the same. And, you know, and you knew that eventually it had to come to an end, but it still sucks. I think it's one of those things where you're right, we knew it would come to an end, but we always thought, okay, Peter's going to keep going. It was just, you know, it was a a known quantity. It's like the fact the Flames are going to wear a red jersey. We just know every year Peter's going to be there, and you never really think about it. Exactly. And, you know... He will be missed by everybody that has ever been a Flames fan. He's just that much of an important person in Flames history. 
we reached out to our community this week through Twitter, through Facebook, through the Calgary Puck Forum, and we got some people who wanted to share some Peter Marr memories. But before we go there, Matt, do you have any Peter Marr memories you want to share? I, uh, well, it's just like everybody else listening to him on the radio. Like when I was a kid, there would be a few times where. I would sit down with my older brother and we'd listen to the game. You know, it, it is what it is, you know, and you just associate the voice with Calgary hockey and, you know, I'm sure every Flames fan has memories of listening to Peter Marr and his excellent broadcasting. I think for a lot of us, it was way past our bedtimes when we were listening to him, and we probably would have gotten in trouble if our parents knew that we were doing it. Yeah, especially those uh, West Coast games against San Jose and such. Yeah. A couple sentiments I thought that I'd share from some of our fans who chimed in. Um, From Calgary Puck, we have a lot of people who are remembering the 2004 run, Um, a lot of people who remember the three Yeah Babies there. But from a a poster who goes by the name Oz Someone, back in the 80s, there was Peter Marr doing play-by-play and Doug Barkley as his color commentator. The best tandem, they were absolutely awesome doing every Flames game. Then on TV, we have Ed Whalen. Calgarians were so fortunate to have the best play-by-play. Good luck, Peter Marr. We'll definitely miss you. And I agree. I think that, you know, I didn't listen to a lot when I was a kid, and I don't know Doug Barkley as well, but listening back to stuff that I've heard, those two and Whalen were such a you know, a great group of guys working that those games. Definitely. Flames fans really did get spoiled with some really top-notch announcing. And, you know, it, it's going to be tough moving forward not having Peter Marr always there. Another poster from Calgary Puck who goes by the name Cliff Fletcher posted that when he was a journalism student in the early 90s, I went to the Saddle Dome to do an interview with Robert Reichel on a practice day. The PR guy told me where to wait for practice to end, and I stood there feeling kind of odd and out of place. The local print beat reporters eyed me with suspicion and contempt. It was pretty uncomfortable. Then Marr walked by, stopped when he saw I was a new face and introduced himself, shook my hand, asked who I was waiting for and who I was interviewing. And he said good luck, and went on his way with a smile on his face. That 30 seconds out of his day made a callow young student feel so much more at ease. So another great Peter Marr story. I've never actually had the chance myself to meet Peter Marr. I wish I had. And when I was putting together this podcast initially, I always thought that Peter Marr was kind of the guy I wanted to aspire to. I know it's big shoes to fill, but and it's unfortunate that I've never got to meet him and we've never got to talk to him on the show. Yeah, and I agree. You know, like, it just sucks. <laughs> a, a friend of the show, Kale Hulse, uh, wanted us to give a memory of his as well. Kale tweeted us and said, After dinner in L.A. and after a beer or two, Pete did a live recall of my first NHL goal for me and a few of the boys. So he's saying that they were sitting around a bar having some drinks and dinner, it sounds like, and Peter actually went into the play-by-play they did around Kale's first goal. And I think that's so awesome to have Peter be able to remember exactly what he'd called and to remember that goal of Kale's. I think that's amazing. But that's the walking dictionary that is Peter Marr. Yeah. And as good of a broadcaster as Peter has been for the past 30-plus years, he also is a very nice person. And, you know, that's... Another part that's hard, you know, because you don't like to have good people, you know, step away from... Everyone that's ever talked about Peter Marr has had nothing but good things to say about him. Um, you know, the the fact that he's taken time out of his day to meet with people. I've heard these listen to tapes sent to him by play-by-play guys in, you know, random little cities somewhere, that sort of thing. So yeah, he's a great guy, and those are the kind of guys you want in the organization. I think that's why we all love Craig Conroy so much, too. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a sad day for us as Flames fans. I know when he 
when he announced it, I was listening to the press conference and I was almost feeling myself getting teary because it, as a fan, I'm being selfish. It's like, Peter, I don't want you to go yet. And it's, it's sad because he's such a great guy and he, you can tell he still loves the flames so much. Exactly. And like, that's the part of this that's difficult is that, you know, you just, there's no avenue to really give your thanks properly and you know express how you know like if he would have uh announced like say at the beginning of the season like the flames fans could at the game could have given him the proper ovation and all that and i'm sure he will be the team has announced that they will have a special ceremony for him yeah so you know it's just hard because you know like there's quite a bit of time between now and then but maybe that's a good thing you know it will help us re-celebrate peter marr when the new season starts true they talked about doing a you know a special game in his honor or something and peter actually said to the team he said you know but that would put the focus on me the focus isn't about me peter said in his press conference that he's just a messenger he's here to tell the fans about our team the calgary flames so he really, I think, doesn't, as much as we all want to, you know, go and hug Peter Marr if we could, Peter doesn't want that. Peter doesn't want the spotlight on him. He actually said when he was going to retire that he told Ken King and said, so should we just send out a press release or something? And King said, no, we have to hold, you know, a formal press conference. And Peter Marr was worried that, well, what if nobody comes? And it turns out that his press conference was the most well-attended press conference of Flames history. So I think that shows a lot about Peter Marr. We were live tweeting uh, the Peter Marr press conference that happened, and you can see that on our Twitter page, at Fireside Podcast, if you want to go back and look at them. But some interesting things that Peter Marr said, some advice that he got from one of his idols uh, early on, Dave Young, and I think this is a great piece of advice. It's better to leave what you do too early rather than leave too late. True enough. And that's exactly what Peter's trying to do. Yeah, I know. I'm at such a loss for words because, you know, he he meant so much to Calgary and it's hard to formulate exactly how much, you know, Calgary and Calgarians appreciate what he has done, you know, bringing his persona to the zeitgeist of Calgary and you know it's just hard to you know say a proper appreciation (laughs) well I think there's one way that we can appreciate him Um, Matt would you join me in giving Peter Marr he has a special phrase that he reserves for special events and we all know what that phrase is would you join me in giving him one final yeah baby salute Definitely. Yeah, Yeah, baby! baby. I think that's the best way that we can uh, celebrate Peter Marr. Um, We also have the special privilege of talking to a man that's worked with Peter Marr for several years now. Another iconic voice of the Flames. We got a chance this week to sit down with Beasley to get his thoughts of Peter Marr. This is Dan Stevenson for Fireside Chat, and we're here with one of our friends of the show, a guy who supported us right from the beginning, the <laughs> other voice of the Flames. This is Beasley. How you doing, Bees? Really good. Really good, Dan. Thanks for having me on. And uh, obviously a lot of people are talking about the voice of the Calgary Flames. That's right. Yeah, yeah Peter Mars, we know, retired this week. Yeah. And we, when we heard that he was retiring, we thought, well, why don't we get the other voice of the Calgary Flames in here? <laughs> and it, it is, it's flattering even to be mentioned in the same breath with him. But, I mean, boy, Peter... How do you, how do you sum up Peter Marr? You can't. Um, he it and you say legend you do, do that right away, but I mean this guy's the hockey Hall of Famer. He's a guy that uh, I go to just as an announcer. Going so Pete, we're we're doing uh, you know obviously this game and we want to talk about uh, this uh, player's name and that he he's like the Bible, right? He is. Of, he's, of he's a walking Wikipedia of the Flames. Yeah, yeah. So uh, it's going to be difficult to to try and make that transition from where he was. And who will be the next one? I well, that's it. I feel bad for the next guy. I mean, oh. he's going to forever be, you know, the guy who's not Peter Marr. And that's the thing. It's going to be compared for the rest of their lives. If not, uh, even for Peter's legacy, it lives on. I mean, it's, it's, it's weird. It's just uh, 
It's the blueprint. And now you're going to build something on top of the blueprint. How do you do that? It's hard. Yeah. So You've worked with Peter for a number of years. Any uh, Peter memory thoughts or memories you want to share with the listeners? Wow. You know, I mean, I think the 04 run, if anybody points to anything, that's where I think everybody was just on fire. There was an, a, a moment that uh, Peter wasn't, you know, engaged like he was. I mean, he was he was a kid again, as as everybody was. But to see him, and there were points, that, you remember that year was a, a questionable year. We didn't think anything was going to happen of it. It's dubbed now the Cinderella year. But I recall just walking down the uh, the catwalk where uh, Peter sits, and I look at him, and, I, and one night he just says, that's it, we're rally caps. I'm going, rally caps? Now, I'm quite a, a distance from him. And here he is. He's flipping his ball cap. Where'd you get the ball cap from, Pete? And he flips this over, and it's like, rally cap time, bees. And I'm going, all right. And he's the most compassionate man that you can ever meet. And in my industry, uh, clearly I walk in as you know the, the hired gun to do the, the big voice, and he's the guy who get, paints the picture. I'm just the one who jumps in with the, you know, the goal. But, I mean, his, his role there, and it's just it, – I don't know how to put a, a, even a, a label on it. And just seeing him in action, I mean, uh, my favorite memory, clearly the, the rally caps, but I would sit down with Peter, Peter every night uh, just before game time, and he would have his sheets laid out, and they were just meticulous, his notes. And I'm going, wow. I said, where do you start? And he goes, what do you need? And I said, oh, just, just a name, and you know, because he's so focused. And I'm going, this is the guy that you know, I, I sit down from, and I just I admire him. He's, he's like the... Uh, the, the liquid honey that I have to listen to at the beginning of a game before I get into the dome and at the end when I listen to the hot stove lounge. He's that guy. So I think clearly the 04 memories of his Yeah Babies, I still have it on my uh, Calgary Flames opener so that every time I open a beer, I've got Peter Barr there you go. eating it out. Yeah, That's a good one. Yeah, and it's my favorite memory of him. That's what I think everyone's going to remember. I remember as a kid, you know, laying in bed, listening to my AM radio, mm-hmm. not having it too loud so my parents wouldn't hear, but yeah. – uh, you know, just, yeah, Peter Marr calling that game. And we're so fortunate as Flames fans yeah. to have Peter Marr. If you ever listen to road games, yeah, you know, you don't realize what you're going to miss until now we're realizing we're going to miss it. Yeah. Oh, uh, this is the, the biggest uh, void in the Calgary Flames lineup. Yeah. He's, he's part of the lineup. I'm sorry. He if is. anybody doesn't he understand, uh, when he paints that picture at the very beginning he's of broadcast, the man. he is. He is the guy that everybody knows. That's the voice. Um, and I just, I do. I think... We we look at this right now because we're it's a surreal. We have to say goodbye to Peter. How do you do that? You don't say goodbye to him. So, um, I clearly I think uh, the the love for Peter. Uh, I I can't even I can't even put it into words. I was three rows back from the final speech, uh, sitting there with uh, you know a couple of people, and I'm just sitting there going, I can't be doing this. We can't say goodbye to Pete. Can't. I, I don't know how fans are going to do it. I mean, they, they express themselves uh, in various uh, forms. Twitter was uh, a buzz. Uh, Facebook, uh, you look at the social media uh, networks, not to mention, of course, the Fan 960, which carried the entire their press conference. And, I mean, they, I mean, did an incredible job covering everything that Peter does. But how do you, how do you fill the void of, you know, the hockey inter- insider, the, you know, well, Today in Flames history? How, who does that? Pete's irreplaceable. Yeah. So. If there's, as you know, we have Joe Neuendijk, we have, um, uh, Al McKinnis, guys who are in the Forever Flame program. Yeah, I think if there's one guy that deserves to be up there more than any player, it's Peter Marr. You know what? That's a really good point, and I'm sure I, I would hope that somebody has looked at that because as much as the legacy of the Calgary Flames, and what are we now, 34 years? How Roughly. long is it? Roughly, yeah. Yeah. 80. Well, no, because, we, yeah, so 34 years. Um, if you cannot recognize that fact, mm-hmm. uh, it would be a shame that, you know, does he fall into the player role? I think he does in in a big in a big picture. Sure. Well, the players we've talked to through Twitter and some of our contacts, I mean, they say Peter's just much of a, of a member of this team as anybody else. Yeah. He's on the plane with them. He's, yeah. you know, the, he's one of the boys. He is. Yeah. And I I don't know how they're ever gonna yeah get over that. It's not that we're you know he's he's not gone. He's just uh, he's moved on right. And it's just I don't know what we're gonna do. Irreplaceable. Yeah. I mean that's an understatement. I've never had the pleasure of meeting Pete, but he seems like the guy who I don't think we've seen the last of. If this team's ever mm. in the the finals again, I can see Pete coming back for one more game. I I don't know if he would do that. I mean, no, uh, no I think that whatever reason for the for the the departure, um, you think he's done? Yeah, um, it. I don't know how he puts the 
the encyclopedia away, though. It's, oh, he can't. It's it's a drawer that just is. It can't be closed. And I feel he'll still get a lot of calls from guys of, "Hey, oh. Pete, I need this, I need that," and Pete will be able to just give it to him. He would be. He'll be an analyst, if not an expert, yeah. on on many different uh, shows, and he could easily fill that role. Oh, like yeah. easily, easily, yeah. We asked our fans some of the most influential voices of the Flames, and there were mm. three that came back: Ed Whalen, Peter Marr. And Beasley. Wow. So we're wow. happy to, we're happy to in, Dude, in, at least have had one of those on our show. So you uh you yeah, you've uh wow. Flames uh, games aren't the same without Beasley. So I'm I'm flattered. Uh Will Ed Whalen was one of my dear friends and uh I'd known him for years in the Calgary market. Uh, much before the Flames yeah. hired me as their their guy. So uh to even be put in that same group, I'm flattered. Those I'm, are the I'm names honored. everybody knows as wow. as the Flames wow. voices. So isn't it interesting? And then I took a, a Twitter picture. I didn't actually post it. I should have. And it's one of those ones, but it was more personal. And I'll show you. And then I'll I'll send it to you, and then you can use it any way you please. But sure. So this we'll, we'll post Beasley's picture up on our Twitter page at Fireside Podcast. Yeah. And here's the man who introduced me on the left. That would be Russ Peak. Okay. And in 1996, Russ, Russ Peak of C- CTV, yep. your Calgary Flames. A smooth, liquid, honey voice. He was the one who said, Bees, you might want to try out for this job. And I went, really? And uh, he was the one who recommended that I throw my hat in there. Nice. I thought it was kind of befitting that I would put the original Flames announcer in the building. That would be Russ Peak on the left, Peter Marr, and, co- of course, in the middle. And I'm the, I'm that, that, that kid on the outside. But uh, with this kind of uh, company, wow. You I mean, happy I feel, to be standing next to those guys. Oh, you can't see, can you? No, not at all. I'm not happy at all. Oh, my gosh. Stand next to legends. Yeah, and they are, both of them. Uh, you know, Russ is just so compassionate about the, the game, and he left in 96, and he actually came up to me during Peter's uh, you know announcement, and he said, here's the deal. I think you might have outdistanced me. And I said, come on, Russ, nobody. You're the, you're the guy. And he goes, no, but I think you did. He says, I think I did 16 years. And he went, how many of you? And I'm like, well, concluding the strikes, 17, 18, you do whatever math you want yeah. to do. Uh, so flattering for sure to be mentioned in the same group. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, it's, uh, you know, people are saying that we can deal with, we will get over Peter leaving. Yeah. But as long as we still have Beasley, something's constant. Uh, so. I, and I think, I don't know if the flames, uh, realize that or even look at that. And so that's something that, that I'm, I'm sure the organization is going to look at if you're going to replace something, uh, as iconic as Peter, I would hope that they have some kind of, uh, a, you know, a plan of how they're going to go forward on that because now again you not only have to replace the uh, the people on uh, you know the radio but what about the tv broadcast that's it is that going to change yeah and yeah we there's a lot of variables there i mean rob kerr's moving back to radio so they've got some familiar voices coming in and but we'll we'll see what happens there i know uh this is the time for you know flames for fans not to mourn but i mean it's like holy uh celebrate the the success of of peter marr and let's uh look forward to what technically, in my opinion, is the rebirth of the team. And we, we saw it coming this year. We did. A, a lot of fans went, uh, and, and friends of mine, it uh, doesn't ma- matter, here in Calgary, around uh, the country. So what's what are the Flames going to do this year? And I say, no, it's a hopeful year. It is. And I said that just in my heart of heart, that I'm I'm there as a, the announcer. I'm still going to give each player the same love. Same and dude. I thought, yeah. I, I had no idea it was going to go this well. Yeah. I mean, I, w- I had bets. People were betting me saying, you guys aren't going to make it to 30 games. And I said, yes, we are. <laughs> it was a hell of a year for the first year of rebuild. Oh. Yeah. And, you know, the way I was looking at it, I was thinking about this yesterday. It's an apt time for Peter to leave, if you think about it. We have, you know, a, a, I guess, resurgence on the ice. We're mm. going through the rebuild there. Yeah. We have a young GM, a yeah. rebuild in the office, and now we have a rebuild in the booth. Yeah. So let's just rebuild everything at once. So this team gets bigger and better and stronger together from all sections. And I... I can see it that way, but I know that I understand there's a lot of fans who are very upset about this. There always will be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we knew at some point, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Peter would leave. Everybody leaves at some point. I guess. It, it, but there's a guy who, you know, in his, uh, you know, farewell at the Saddle Dome said, you know, I mean, he, he followed uh, his idols. And you never, you never go out as a loser. You go out yeah, on top. Exactly. And, and he did. Oh. Peter definitely went on top. Yeah. So I, I see this as an opportunity for somebody to come into that uh, that role, and if you don't learn from him, I would be shocked if you did not go to him for any kind That's of it. guidance. You can listen to reels and reels of tape of what Peter did in the past, 
But if you don't recognize what the tradition and the, the style, again, everybody's going to have their own style. You don't have to be Peter Marr, too. But how is that going to reflect uh, for sponsors, for yeah. fans, for, for anybody coming into the, you know, the, the team? I don't know. And this, from, what I, from what I know about Peter, he'll be more than happy to help that guy and coach that guy and make sure that that guy's ready to go when the puck yeah. drops. That's what Peter is to me. Uh, every time that I had any kind of question, Peter was that guy. We actually had a couple of conversations just before. I didn't know last game was coming up. Nobody did. And it's like, do you know this name? And I'm going, well, what I'm going to find out from the, you know, the management team or not the play-by-play guy next door, and I'll go down to the out-of-town team all the time, not because I had to discredit Pete. What I wanted to do is just find out, okay, is this true uh, that this name is pronounced this way? And then Pete would come back and went, well, I thought it was this way. And we would have this conversation because the one thing I did never want, I never wanted to do, was go on to announce anybody's name different than Peter. Yeah. And this, you can go back in the history of the Flames that I've been with them. That uh, Peter would say, "Well, this is the way the kid wants it. Well, let's do it that way." I mean, Giordano is a great example of that. Perfect, Giordano, and that came not only from Peter, who who said was in that press conference in that scrum, when uh, you know Mark says, "Well, actually, technically, it's Giordano, not Giordano." But all your friends call you Gio. Yeah. The coaches call you exactly. Gio. I've called you Giordano forever. I, and, I mean, Mark still laughs about it. But, I mean, it's it's one of those ones where Speak we – Speak up earlier. Yeah, yeah. Right? Just let me know because yeah. now I, I sound like the guy who got it wrong. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you and Pete both. Oh, no. So those ones I, I do laugh at. And I go, you know what? There's a there's a, a love for this team that uh, you can't weigh. There, there isn't. If you had to measure uh, like a – Yardstick, if not a you know measuring tape, you can't measure the the pride no. that goes into this team. And a lot of people, if you go back to the 04 run, because we talk about that a lot, I remember Eric France once saying, "Bees, you're not part of the team. You're not. You call it your team, but it's not your team. It's, you're not. You're not part of the team." And it was just one of those kind of offhanded uh, Eric France's comments. I went, "Yeah, but I am." And but it was one of those ones where I had to digest it, and I go, "I see what you mean. I'm not on the ice." But it's it's a voice that uh, you know brings them out on the ice. And Peter, I mean, Peter tells the story yeah. of the team. I get to you know show love. I mean, who else? Who else in the world uh, out of thirty other you know announcers in the world gets to do that nightly? Exactly. Right? Uh, wow. Yeah. You and Peter are both part of the show. You're yeah. part of the fan experience. Mm. You're a front part of that. I think you're yeah. part of you know the team to everybody. Wow. So. Yeah. We were happy to be able to have another iconic voice of the Flames talk to us about Peter Marr. It's, uh, it was a tough thing when yeah. we heard he was retiring. We thought, who better to give us their memories than yeah. Beasley? And uh, again, if we, yeah, I can leave you with any memory, it's just at Forever Flame. I love that. I think that tribute should be done. And something will be done for Peter, I know. Um, but here's a Hockey Hall of Famer. Who gets into that category in that, in that uh, you know, lifetime? And he did. He did it master uh, as a master. He just went in. I mean, there's there's certain uh, slogans and, and phrases that he will be remembered forever. But this is the time that, yeah, I would go back and remember all those moments. And I was listening to uh, the fan and just driving home and listening to all the comments about random fans who have met him or maybe not have met him, but knew of this man. And it's just those memories as you. I mean, you grew up here, yeah. uh, you know, listening to this man. Uh, who who do you turn to? I mean, those are those memories that you'll never erase. That you'll never take that away from the fan experience, which is Peter Marr. And I, I still say that should be uh, labeled as a, a press box or something, and it's not in posthumous. This is not because Peter is still very much a part of this team. And, yeah, we just want to celebrate the fact that he is part of the legacy of the Calgary Flames. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He'll forever be, I think, the true voice of the Flames for a oh, lot of people. I, I'm not the voice. He is. I just have that big voice because they give me a bigger microphone. That's all. That, that would do it, right? Bigger's <laughs> well, always better, right? Well, that's what they say. No, it's the speakers. That's what it is. Yeah. Bigger's always better. Yeah. yeah. I know there's been a lot of games where I've actually muted the – I actually set up my TV to be mm. on enough of a delay so that it matches the radio, yeah. turned off the TV guys and listened to Pete call the game. And when you can see the picture yeah. and also the picture painted for you, it's, it's yeah. a fantastic experience. So. Go back to the gold medal game uh, in Vancouver. I mean, this is – Peter gets to call the most iconic Canadian gold medal in my mind yeah, on our I soil, agree. and you get to call that, and Iggy's in it. Wow, <laughs> I know. Again, that it it wrote itself, but it didn't. Peter was part of that. He he's he orchestrated that. Yeah, yeah. And you got to tell an entire nation, and it's recorded forever. That's the beauty. A lot of the calls that you still remember, uh, you're going to hear those forever because that that's going to be in de- or embedded into your brain. You, you don't get rid of that. It's like a song. 
It just keeps coming That's back. It, it reoccurs yeah. all the time. And with YouTube and everything we have now, the next generation of Flames fans will still be able to easily go back and hear oh. the great Peter Marr. Yeah, you'll if any you know young announcer or fan is out there listening right now and saying, "I want to do that," it start early and start yeah. practicing. This is a, a love uh, for for something that he wanted to do since he was a kid, and clearly read his history, and it's all about that of how he he started as very young you know kid calling and it's a great story about and my favorite story of his is that the Leafs said you know you're going to be this guy who's going to be the announcer but the only way we're going to do it and this is Ballard actually saying here's a hockey set here's here's a like a, a game of hockey okay tell me the game wow. and, and paint the picture and that's where he first got his his chance to do that and then they put him in the chair and said you're a natural I mean as much as table talk hockey is something that people go oh yeah that's old school that's one of the ways to do it. Yeah, learn sure. from the master, which is, if any, there's anybody out there, learn from Peter Marr. It would be hard to find a tabletop hockey set today, but, you know, <laughs> Xbox games or whatever it is, however we play hockey yeah, these days. Yeah, no, exactly. Scour garage sales this summer and find it, yourself an old that, table hockey why game. Why not? Put on the uh, the voice, uh, Peter Marr. That's and right. And I just, it'll, it'll haunt me for the rest of my life uh, with that, that voice. It's just, it. It'll never so, go away. No. No, and that's the beauty. It will never. It will never. It won't be snuffed out. No. Not a chance. It, it, it's something that we as fans will always hear. Hmm. We'll hear his, his favorite catchphrases, the phrases we know of Peter's. Yep. Every time something big happens, we'll be you know playing them back in our heads. I have the T-shirt. I don't know how many people do. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have words to, to explain my uh, my admiration and love for that man. He's just, he is the consummate professional. He was my Bible. And yeah. And I listen to him all the time. I, that's I hate to steal his catchphrase, but I think it's apt to say we could put Peter's career in the wind column. Put it in the wind column. Peter Marr. Wow. That's right. Thanks for your time, Beasley. Not a problem. Thanks, Dan. Well, Matt, we heard from Beasley on that one. Good to hear from a guy who's talked to Peter Marr, and we know that, you know, those two have worked together so long, and I'm glad we're not losing Beasley because that's the other iconic voice of the Flames to me. Yeah, and he'll still be there calling all the goals and penalties calling all the goals, calling all the penalties. So, you know, at least some things will be constant when we listen to the Flames next year. Um, before we go, I think, as you mentioned before the show, we should give a shout-out to some former Flames players and personnel, to Daryl Sutter, who's been uh, a great coach for the LA Kings this year and has got his team out of the hole they were in in the playoffs to win the first round. Yeah, him and Robin Regeer deserve a lot of kudos for becoming only the fourth team in NHL history to actually rally from a 3-0 deficit. I would expect nothing less from a Daryl Sutter team. Yeah. Well, it's actually kind of weird. Uh, If I recall correctly, Mike Richards, Jeff Carter, and Justin Williams were all on Philadelphia's 2010 team that actually managed to do the same thing against Boston. So I think they're the only guys in NHL history that have ever been a part of two of those. Yeah, I think you're right. And the other uh, flame I think we should give some kudos to is Jerome Aginla, who's having a great year in Boston. He's had a good playoff so far. And, you know, as a as a Jerome Aginla fan, I hope that he can win the Cup this year. And I'm sure a lot of Flames fans are following in what you just said, so... I'm hoping for a Boston versus L.A. Stanley Cup final. The battle of Sutter and Regeer versus Ginla. It'd be a great, great matchup to watch. Definitely. Before we log off this week, I um, wanted to promote some things that we have coming up with the podcast. Um, over the next couple of weeks, starting on about May 5th, we're going to have an article that Matt's writing, at least one a day, profiling some of the young players that are in the draft profiling um, the players that are going to be around where the Flames are going to be picking. And we're trying to do about a round a week. So the week of the fifth, we'll be profiling the guys in the first round, then the second round, third round, etc. So those will be on firesidechat.ca, and we'll also post the links on our Twitter page, at Fireside Podcast, and our Facebook page, facebook.com slash firesidepodcast. So check those out if you're interested, if you want to know more about the young players who you might see wearing a Flames jersey in the near future. Yeah, and realistically, most people know the guys that are in the first round because, you know, they've been talked about so much. Or at least the top five in the first round. Yeah, 
So you got guys like Reinhardt, Bennett, Dalcalia, Dre Sadel, and Ekblad. So we should be getting one of those guys. I also threw a couple other players in there just to, you know, different opinions and all that. Uh, but for the more important articles will be like the players that might be available at 34 and 54 when the Flames pick again in the second round because they don't necessarily have a lot of coverage. So it'll give at least some information to so that way you're not wondering like who are these people. Yeah, and Matt's trying to get some video coverage of them too so you can go on there and watch some highlight packages and really acquaint yourself with who these young men are. Yeah, got to scour YouTube and other similar places to see if I can dig up anything on especially the third round guys because there's not really a lot of information out there if you're having trouble with the third round guys good luck for our seventh round and then to go along with that we won't be broadcasting weekly anymore from this point on we'll broadcast when there's interesting uh, content and flames news to cover around the draft and free agency and that sort of thing but the next episode we will put out uh, is going to be the end of our review series that we started where we were looking at the young players in the system. We've looked at the wingers, and we've looked at the defensemen so far. Our next episode will be the centers and goalies who we've combined into one episode. So that'll give you more of a picture of the players who are currently in the flame system, not guys who have yet to be drafted, but players who the Flames already maintain the rights to, and who you might expect to see moving up the depth chart and onto the Flames roster in the next couple of years. Yeah, and then following that, we'll be doing a draft preview episode as well, just so, like, they tie in the articles with, you know, a discussion and all that, so. And that'll be, that'll be close to the draft. We'll do probably a draft analysis after the draft, and then we'll start gearing up for free agency season. Lots of content to come. Yeah, this is probably one of the seasons where we have the most to talk about, but not at the most regular frequency. So we won't be on weekly talking about stuff, at least at this point in May, because there's just not a lot to talk about at this point. Yeah, because the draft's at the end of June, so, you know, you got like seven weeks. You know, you can only talk about like the 80 or so players that are relevant for so many days, (laughs) you know. So subscribe to our uh, podcast feed at firesidechat.ca or through any of the social media channels, and you'll be notified first as soon as a new episode comes up, when it does come up, and we'll also try to post there in advance of when you can expect a new episode. But as of right now, we're just kind of saying we will broadcast when there's something interesting to talk about until we get near the draft, and that's why we put this episode together this week. Yeah, and I'll be posting the articles starting on May 5th and uh, when we're getting ready to do our next show I'll include that a post in there that like our next episode's gonna be on whatever day thanks for doing that Matt yeah any other flames news you want to talk about nah I'm good then I think it's time we put this one in the win column and we sign off for this week yeah thank you for everything Peter Thanks a lot, Peter. Enjoy your retirement. Walking to the left corner for Aginla. Aginla to the left circle. Aginla shot. Joseph Bay rebound. He scores! Yeah, baby! Yeah, baby! My kid, Gillen has scored! The Flames win it! One nothing! Yeah, baby! Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.